It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Suzanne Samard, Professor of Forest Ecology, over 100 scientific papers focusing on below ground interactions, specifically between the roots of forest trees and fungi called mycorrhizae. She was one of the first ecologists to apply novel methods to trace the extensive networks that link organisms in the soil. Her assertions that trees might use these networks to trade resources and messages or to aid relatives or neighbors initially were questioned by some. But her careful work has provided strong evidence that the system is mutually connected. In addition to her work as a forester and an academic, Dr. Samard loves taking her students out into the field and this is sometimes the very first time that they've had the opportunity to walk in an old growth forest or in the Alpine. She also eloquently communicates with the general public through TED Talks, in documentaries, and in magazines like Smithsonian and National Geographic. Please help me to welcome Dr. Samard to our forum. Wow, it's really great to be here. Those lights are so bright. So um, I really, really appreciate being here. And you know, there's been some amazing speakers. And it's a hard, hard act to follow, but I'll try to. So um, when, when Lisa and Jim called me up, they said, we want to hear about your story and your journey through science. And so that's really how I've organized what I'm going to tell you. Um, it has been a very personal journey. And so I, I thought I would organize uh, my thinking in a spiral. So a spiral is a cultural symbol. It's, it's, it's actually in many, many cultures around the world. And it really symbolizes a pathway to enlightenment. And often the middle of the spiral is, is the place of birth. It's a physical awareness of your, of your world around you. And as a, you grow and evolve, you move towards the outside of that spiral as you grow in awareness. And in this particular symbol, you can think of those little things that are, that are raying out like the sun or like the, eventually you, you develop a very sophisticated and enlightened uh, uh, relationship with your people and your environment. In, in, in the Northwest Aboriginal culture, you, this, you could think of this as the medicine wheel, and the Aboriginal people will move through this spiral of medicine through, several times through their lives, from the, from the center outwards, and then from the outwards back into the center to reincarnate in some other way. And so I thought of my research and also, also my own development in terms of this spiral. And I'm going to take you through um, the, these words on the right, it, kind of as a way to you know, take you through how I came or how I grew through this spiral to seek balance in my research and also in my life. So I just want to tell you yeah, about where I came from. I came from this place which is an incredible place. These are the old growth cedar uh, hemlock rainforests of, of British Columbia. These are some of the most biodiverse places in North America. They also also some of the most productive places in, on the west coast of North America. The productivity is related to the biodiversity that's there. And I grew up crawling through these forests. So um, based on Dr. Gilbert's talk, I think that I'm full of really good microorganisms from living here. <laughs> so just where exactly is that? Um, in relation to here, so you can see that this is actually a, a map that shows the, the location of the first peoples of North America. And you can see that, um, you know, where we are over by um, where the Menami, the Winnebago, the Dakota, the Ojibwe people live, all the way over to where I came from, which is where the Shuswap Nation and the Kootenai Nation um, we're from. And I say this because this, this place is an ancient place. These people 
the people, the original people have been here for thousands and thousands of years and they have very much to teach us and we have very much to learn from them and I have learned as much as I can because I, I think that it, it really informs the work that I do. This is actually just a map of British Columbia which shows uh, more closely the locations and the numbers of the First Nations that live in, in the province that I call British Columbia. There's actually 25 nations that live in this small place. And where I come from is where the Sequimec and the Kootenai join together. Um, which is in this place. So this is the Shuswap River. Um, this is the Taltan Indians who lived along the river uh, where my ancestors who came from France and then emigrated through Quebec and then on into British Columbia eventually homesteaded and, and uh, developed their livelihoods. So they became integrated with the, with the, with the Indians, um, but not in a very, very integrated way. And I regret that. And I think that um, we need, you know, as we move through uh, truth and reconciliation in Canada, that the peoples are coming together. And what I've, so one of the things that I've learned through my work as I work with the First Nations of, of the West Coast is that they really do live this spiral of life that we have so much to learn from. This is the, the family pole, also what, what anthropologists call the totem. And I think the totem or the family pole really signifies a lot of how that philosophy of life, that way of knowing, that epistemology of the way of knowing about life. And the totem as, as, you know, um, is something that is built to um, declare the territory of a family. It's called a family pole. And that totem is left for the life, and then eventually it starts to decay and it returns to the earth. And as, as people who colonize North America, we like to take that totem pole and put it in a museum and keep it archived so we can look at it, but that is not the way that it was meant to be. It's meant to be in the cycle of life and return to the earth. So, the Aboriginal people of North America and actually all over the world have lots of sayings for this, of this returning back to the earth. And in the, in the Coast Salish, the, the Hamakaman tribe say Netsamast, which means we are one. All of the Aboriginal people have got sayings that are, we are one with nature, we are connected. This theme that keeps running through this conference. So where did my family come in? Now, so we, my family homesteaded in this er in this area, the Shushwap area of the Shushwap Indians, and we became uh, horse loggers. And so when I grew up, my grandfather and my uncle, great uncles and my uncles and my dad were all horse logging in those rainforests that I showed you the first picture of. And in the process of logging that area, um, they took trees out of the forest, but the trees were, when I grew up, you couldn't actually tell where people logged. Um, this is part of that logging process, is that they would use horses to take out the occasional tree, send it down a mountain on, on a flume, and then end, ended up in river drives, which then moved down into the lower, the lower mills. And, and this picture is actually my grandfather is the guy with the white hat. And my great, my great, my great uncle is the guy in the middle, and my uncle is the guy on the right. So, so as homesteaders, we actually had what I thought was a very small impact on the land. That's what I saw as a kid. But of course, when I stood back and looked um, closer, so this is the, the forest where we, would, where we logged, my family logged. But when we, I looked, stood back and looked more closely at what the impact of the homesteading was on the land, it was actually very large. And this is the, the river drives after, you know, after the spring runoff that came from where my family logged and going down into the Shushwap River. So you can imagine the impact that this kind of activity had on the First Nations people and the land and also the salmon that migrated up in the rivers. So when I started in forestry, this is, this is me when I was 20, um, <laughs> by the time I got into forestry, the whole model of, of forestry had changed. So from small scale horse logging, what we call jippo logging, um, to these large scale industrial clear cutting. And at the time, when I was in my 20s and then er into my early 30s, the people started to rise up over this clear-cutting. It, it was called, back then we called it the war in the woods. 
By the early, early 1990s, um, our, the Aboriginal people of British Columbia were really up in arms over the clear-cutting of their islands along what's now known as Clyquit Sound and the Great Bear Rainforest. There were a whole bunch of other movements going on at the same time, including um, you know, Rachel Carson's book coming out in the 1960s, the Women's Liberation Movement, and, which seems so old-fashioned now, but isn't it amazing how these things come around again? It's a spiral. <laughs> so, let's see. so it didn't stop though, right? We didn't stop clear cutting. We didn't stop homogenizing our landscape. There were protests, but those protests were sort of effective at the time, but then they became, you know, they became muted and, and, and these things took on a life of their own. And so by the time the 1990s rolled around and onward, our landscape now looks like this. I call this a, a homogenization of the landscape. Um, and so a homogenization in the fact that, that clear cutting was the dominant form of harvesting, which is not that much un, uh, unlike the agro, agro, uh, agro business that you're talking about here at this conference. Okay, so these, these clear cuts then were taking forests like this, which were immensely diverse and immensely um, spiritual, and converting them into plantations that look like this. Not much different than the corn plantation of, of, of the Midwest. And so what, what happened, the, sort of the model of how this happened was um, clear cutting would be followed by a pre preparation of the site. And that site would homogenize the soil, that site preparation. And then trees would be planted, usually one species. Now we might plant two species. Where there, might, that where there would have been 13 or 15 to start with. The site, these little forests were then simplified even, even further by taking out the plants that we didn't want. So if there was a birch or an aspen or an alder, those were plucked out of the ecosystem. And the idea being that the more plants that we took out, the more native plants we took out, the more we cleansed those forests, the more those resources would go into the trees which was very simplistic thinking, but that is how the thinking was, and it actually still is today. So I came, you know, I started studying these systems, and I realized that these cleansed systems, and they truly are cleansed systems compared to what, what I had grown up knowing, what, what happened to the majesty of this system when we turned it to this? And what I started seeing as I started studying these forests is that they were not well. The forests were not well. So this is a, a pine forest that's been planted in the middle of a subboreal forest that's got about 10 species of trees in it. And as climate is changing and the stresses are increasing on that land, the trees are succumbing to various diseases so, and insects. So when I, I started doing studies on the landscape to see how much is, is the forest damaged by this, and I found that about half of the trees that we plant are actually not going to actually make it to adulthood, you know, to become big old trees. So there's definitely something wrong. So I thought, well, I, I would like to figure out why. And as a forester, always focused on trees and plants, I, I thought, well, since there's so much disease in these forests, I must look below ground. So I started studying the old growth forests, and I started looking in a lot of soil pits. And so coming back to my, my spiral, where am I on this spiral now? As I grew up, I started to become more aware so that I could figure out how the balance in this ecosystem had been disrupted. So I'm moving along this spiral of, aware, of awareness. Where am I here? So looking below ground, I wanted to figure out what was it about the underground community, the fungal community, the microbial community, the soil food web that we had disrupted by turning these forests into monocultures. What had we done? And at that time, there was a study that came out that had been done by David Reed in the UK, where he had figured out in the laboratory, not out in the forest, that when he grew pine seedlings together in little root boxes in the laboratory and he colonized them with mycorrhizal fungi, a mycorrhizal fungi fungus is a kind of beneficial fungus that trades 
nutrients and water that it gathers from the soil for photosynthate that the plant fixes. It's a mutualism that all of our plants, all of our trees, except for a small handful of families, um, all over the world form these mutualistic associations. And what David Reed found is, was that when these pine seedlings were colonized by these mycorrhizal fungi, that they could actually link up the plants together. And the reason that they could do that is that a lot of these plants have fungi that they share in common. Even though there are thousands and thousands of species of these of fungi, um, that there's enough that are shared in common between plants that they can actually hook plants up together, kind of like a telephone wire, telephone wire hooking up your houses so you can talk to your neighbors. And so I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder if, if that, that linkage or that network that he is showing is operative in real forests. And nobody had really looked before to see if that was true. So I, I did a study. But before I did, I started talking to my friends and colleagues, and I found out that actually David Reed wasn't the first person to figure this out. Um, there was an elder of the Snohomish tribe of the Sal Coast Salish people, Subiai. Subiai spoke of the ancient story of the tree people. And I have to say, just as a, a little bit of a, you know, to explain this, in the, in the coastal Aboriginal cultures and in the East here, um, the people considered the animals and the trees and the plants as equals to people. And they called the trees the tree people and the plants the plant people and the fungi the fungi people. So Subiai spoke of the ancient story of the tree people, the trees, that tells how trees have much to teach us about their diversity and symbiotic nature that under the forest floor, there is this intricate and vast system of roots and fungi that keeps the forest strong. This is ancient knowledge. It didn't take David Reed to go and do a little study in the laboratory for people to already know this. So we were rediscovering this, going along the spiral, but moving backwards on it. Um, he goes on, Subiai goes on in his teachings, and he says this story captures an important teaching for building alliances for communal strength, diversity, and roles that each member in the web of the whole community, and that together we are stronger. Fundamental teachings of, of, of Subiai in, in the Coast Salish. And I think, that just to sort of come back to this point, is that how this knowledge, this Aboriginal knowledge, we have so much to learn from it. It's a different way of knowing. It's a different epistemology than we're used to. For example, if we look at how we develop science knowledge in Western science, we set a hypothesis and we move forward. We kind of have goals and we try to meet those goals and make discoveries. In Aboriginal knowledge systems, it's a spiral of discovery, where you move from the inward outward, and then back inward again as you reflect on what you learned, and then go back again and move outward. It's a completely di different way of seeing and learning about the world. And I think that we can, we can bring these two amazing, actually, ways of knowing together to, to, do, uh, to, to learn even more. Okay, so let me move on. So I mentioned that uh, you know, th this underground network was discovered by David Reed. It was known by the Aboriginal people, but I wanted to know more. Um, how is it operating in my forest that we're dying? And uh, so uh, just as an aside, the mycorrhizal fungi that are in forests, these are the ones that form the mushrooms. Um, so when you're walking in the forest or in your grassland and you see mushrooms, those are mostly what we call ectomycorrhizal species. Ectromycorrhizal species are, 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 of fungi are a specific group that mostly associate with trees and shrubs. There's thousands of species. Douglas fir, which is one of the dominant tree species in my neck of the woods, forms about with uh, associations with about 2,000 species of ectomycorrhizal fungi. There's other ones. There's arbuscular mycorrhizas, which form with the maples and, and the cedars and yew trees. And there's about 200 species of that fungi worldwide. And there's four other groups that form endomycorrhizas as well that I'm not going to talk about, but just keep in mind these two groups, the ecto and the endomycorrhizas. So 
just to go back to what David found and what others were seeing in these laboratory root, root boxes was that the root tips of two plants, so you can imagine that the one coming up from the ceiling there on the slide is the root tip of one plant and the other root tip coming up from the, from the left. And you can see how they're linked together by these fungal hyphae that grow through the soil and, and can link plants together. So, okay, what does it look like in a real forest? So I had a graduate student, now I'm gonna tell you about some of the research I've been doing and how we've progressed this work. What we did is we went into some old growth forests, not the cedar hemlock forest, but the Douglas fir forest of the interior. And we went into six forests and we rolled back the forest floor, kind of like rolling your carpet. And we took all of the fungal material that we could find, all the root tips, and all the mushrooms, and all of the truffles that form below ground, and we did DNA sequencing of those fungi. And we looked specifically at two species of fungi, uh, Rhizopogon vesiculosus and Rhizopogon vinicolor. And we did not just regular Sanger se sequencing to find out what they were, we did another kind of sequencing called microsatellite sequencing, where we looked at very short sequences of DNA. And the reason we did that is we wanted to know if different individual fungi would link the different trees together, and if we could tell that, if we could actually map that out, we could see how all these different trees were linked together. Okay, so these were um, old forests. They were about 250 years old, and they're what we call multi-storied forests and multi-aged. And so in these forests, there are, even though it's uh, a single species of tree, um, there's many ages, and it's very structurally diverse. So this picture that I'm showing you here is actually a map of what that forest looks like when you look down on it, of one of the six that we sampled. So let me explain this picture. In this picture, those big circles represent trees. And the bigger and darker the circle, the bigger and older the tree. So, so here we have a bunch of old trees. I'm going to try and find the pointer. Oh, oh. Never mind. <laughs> um, so, so you can see that there's a number of old trees here. Those are big, dark, old, the big, dark circles. Perfect, thank you. Yes, got it. Go ahead. Okay, and then within the network of these old trees, so you can see that these old trees are linked. I, never mind, I'm not going to use that thing. <laughs> If you, so you can see that those big old trees are actually linked to, to many, many other circles. And the little tiny circles represent little trees. So they're the younger trees that have established within the network of the old trees. So a seed falls from, from an old tree, it lands on the forest floor, it germinates, it sends out a radical, which is a little root, into the soil. It encounters that whole soil microbiome. Um, and one of the things that it starts to do is signal out to fungi, and it'll signal out to mycorrhizal fungi so that they can form an association. And within a few months, about three months, they form a symbiosis. And so these little seedlings are signaling out to the network of the old trees of these rhizopogon vinicolor vesiculosis network to form an association with them. And so in that way, the little trees establish within the network of these old trees. So when we started analyzing this network, we found a few things. Number one, everything was linked to everything else. And number two, that the biggest, oldest trees were the most highly linked. So we started calling these hub trees, which, you know, the hub is kind of a, a language that we use when we look at neural networks. And we figured out that the structure of this neural net, of this network actually followed the structure of a biological neural network. Kind of like, same structure as the network in your brain. Um, with highly connected hubs and then more or smaller or low, more lowly connected nodes that are, are associated with them. Okay, so that's cool. Everything is connected to everything else. The young ones are establishing within the network of the old ones. Um, so we started doing some experiments with these. What does it really mean? I mean, does, how does that network actually function? And so we started going in and planting seedlings next to these old trees. 
And we found, and we, some of the seedlings we grew where they were, or seeds we planted where they were connected to the old trees by growing them in these little bags that, that they could form connections with the old trees. And we compared them to seeds where they, we, we didn't allow them to connect to the old trees. They still have, grew in these bags, but, and they had little holes, but they were so small that they couldn't make the connections. And we found that when, when the little seeds could connect with the old trees, that their survival went up by four times. Okay, so that's interesting. Why? So what we did is we started labeling these old trees with different isotopes, carbon and phosphorus and deut deuterated water and, we found, and nitrogen, N15. And we found that these nutrients and water were flowing from the big old trees into the seedlings. And we figured out that it flowed through what we call a source sink gradient. It's kind of like an osmotic gradient from the replete, rich old ones rich in nutrients and carbon and photosynthate down to the little ones that were struggling in the understory. So that's cool. The next thing we wanted to know was, okay, can, can these old trees actually recognize who those seedlings are? Can they recognize whether they're related to them or not? And so we, we did more experiments. So experiment after experiment after experiment, you get the idea, it was like a, a really fun and it took about a dozen years to do this. And we figured out that, so we planted seeds that were seeds from the old, old trees and we compared it to seeds with, that were from trees that were from a different mountain range. And we grew them next to these old mother trees. And we found that the, we call them mother trees by now, we found that these old trees could actually recognize which seeds were theirs and which ones were not. And what they did, the way we could tell that is that the, the, the old trees would send more carbon to the ones that were their kin. And they would send them more water. And so the kin seedlings actually grew bigger roots, they had bigger mycorrhizal networks, and they grew faster. So in, you know, in human societies, in animal ecology, that process is called kin recognition. Now we know that trees actually have this ability to recognize their own kin. So this obviously has evolutionary, <laughs> evolutionary consequences. Okay, so along my spiral of awareness, now I know from my work that connection is hugely important. And that old trees, big old trees, the elders in the community are the hubs of the community and that they have a big role to play in the organization of the rest of the community. That they share resources, what we could measure, what I call ecological wisdom. Just like in our own communities where our elders also share their wisdom. And this is, um, this is Ketayak from the Coast Salish, and he's an elder. And in, in that language, the word elder is actually a verb. In our language, we tend to think of an elder as a, as a thing, right? As a person. But in this language, it's a verb. And I think that's a really important distinction. It's an action. That what I'm talking about in these forests these old forests, the, that these old things have roles to play, really important roles in bringing community together. So this, along my circle of awareness, my spiral of awareness, my enlightenment, I realize that respect for elders is hugely important, not just within my own community, but within the forest. Okay, so I said that, you know, when we labeled the old trees that, that they shared resources, we, I've also looked at this between species, different species growing together, and they share and link up together as well. Birch and fir connect, and they send resources back and forth between them. And it's not a one-way street. You know, it's back and forth, back and forth. And what I found is that when, um, when birch is leafing out in the springtime and is photosynthesizing and full of nitrogen, it sends more carbon to Douglas fir that's growing in its understory than fir sends back to birch. But in the summertime, when fir grows taller, uh, or, sorry, or birch grows taller than the fir and is photosynthesizing, sorry, I got it the other way around. When the birch is photosynthesizing more than the, never mind. 
It goes back and forth according to who needs it most over the growing season. And uh, so, okay, so not just in this ecosystem, we've looked at this in many ecosystems now, that this, this change in the direction of the flow following the seasons happens in the Arctic. It happens in the, tro in, the, in the temperate forests. It happens in the coastal forests. So it's very attuned to the environment as well. And when we shade one of those species, even more goes from the replete to the, to the one in need. Okay. Okay, so where are we? Another principle of this spiral of, of, uh, of awareness, of the pathway of enlightenment, is that even in forest communities, there is this sharing, there is this recipro reciprocation, reciprocity, this back and forth for the greater good. Okay, so here's another important study that we did. We also started looking at dying trees. So as the mother trees die, what do they do? So what we found, we started labeling tree, mother trees, old trees, and then we would stress them out <laughs> by plucking needles off of them or girdling them and then following their carbon flow. And we found that as those trees were stressed and figured that they were on their way out, they were dying, they started shuttling carbon. They moved their carbon out of, their, out of them themselves and into the network and into the surrounding seedlings. Okay, so they were passing their legacy onto the next generation. So then we asked, does it matter whether they're kin or strangers? And we found that the kin seedlings got more than the strangers. Another thing we found at the very same time that when we stressed those old trees, they also sent defense signals. So they would send, they would warn their neighbors. They would say, hey, you know, something's attacking me and you need to be aware of this. And so the seedlings would pick up that message and upregulate their defense genes and produce more defense enzymes. And the kin seedlings, again, were able to pick up those messages more readily and then increase their defense. Not only that, we followed this over multiple generations, and we found that that gene regulation was passed on to the next generation. Okay, so, so what's happening in the environment now is actually being um, written into the genes of the current generations and passed through the seeds onto the next generation. So this is just a way of thinking about this. this. Imagine you're looking down on the forest and what you're seeing is these networks of, of trees that are intermingled with each other and they're talking to each other through their mycorrhizal networks. Okay, so below ground, there's these highways of communication. And I have to say, it's not just below ground. There's communication pathways above ground as well, which is another talk. But just think about it. If, you know, if you're in a community or in a family and you want to communicate and all you knew how to do was talk, you're actually quite vulnerable. We have multiple ways of communicating with each other. We have body language. We can send email messages. Um, we can, you know, whisper. We can shout. Same thing with trees. They have multiple pathways of communication. And why, why wouldn't they? Okay, so... In the forest then, these old trees, and you see these seedlings growing up underneath, they're in a, they're in a big network that's like a super highway and they're constantly in, in contact and communication. So now I know, you know, along my spiral of awareness, now I know that there's kinship in forests as well. Not just, a, not, you know, so I've gotten awareness that there's connection, there's respect, there's reciprocity, there's also kinship. Okay, now I want to tell you one more story. I've started working more and more with the Aboriginal people of the West Coast, and I'm working with the Haltzik, the Simshan, and the Haida Nations. And all of the people um, along the West Coast work with cedar, and they're also people of the salmon. And they're very proud stewards of the cedar trees and the salmon. So they actually had abundant, a great wealth, a great abundance prior to colonization, um, where they lived and thrived in, these, in their communities. Millions of people actually uh, across Canada, um, if you look at the whole population reconstruction. So very vibrant, wealthy communities. And one of the ways that they did this is they, they had 
you know, they, they cultivated the populations of, of the salmon and the clams and the other, the abalone, the eulican, the, um, the creatures that they depended on. And the salmon, they, they built what are called fish traps. Or, or, and so the fish traps, actually, if you look along the west coast, there's these ancient fish traps all along the west coast at the mouths of the major estuaries. And so the way they work is that the salmon, which are adronomous, um, how do you say that? They, they live in the ocean and then they, they lay their eggs in, in, the, in the rivers. And so they live part of their life cycle out in the ocean and the rest, and they spawn in the rivers. And so the way that these fish traps work is that the salmon come in and when the tide goes out, the fish are trapped behind the stone traps and then the people would then harvest the fish that way. But there is a big a big difference in the way we would do it than the way they did it in that they they only f took fish on the ebb tide so the low tide and they always threw back the big fish to keep the population strong especially the females they always threw back the big females so that they would be abundant and produce more eggs in the future and in that way they kept the populations of the salmon very high Another part of the story is that the salmon then would, would migrate up to the, up the rivers, they would spawn, the, the salmon carcasses would, would be along the rivers, and then and the people would harvest some of those, but the rest were, were left to decay or picked up by the grizzly bears, the wolves, the eagles, and so on. So these grizzly bears and wolves would take the fish and, and they would, a, a bear like this could take 150 fish in a single day and move it up onto the riverbanks. And so they would, and we actually followed these bear trails through the forest to see where they actually would sit and eat the fish. And what we found is that they would crawl up onto these banks above the, the river and with their cubs and they would eat them under these big old trees the big old mother trees. And so they would eat their fish, but they only ate a small part of the fish, actually. So the wolves only eat, eat the brains because they, don't, they're, because they know that there are different you know, parasites in the flesh. Again, and the, the grizzly bears also only ate a portion of the fish. So the rest is left there to decay. And so it decays, it seeps into the soil. The mycorrhizas pick up that salmon nitrogen which is heavy in, in, in 15 because it's been out in the ocean for a long time, and that nitrogen moves through the mycorrhizal network and into the trees, and then is stored in the tree rings. And they say that about 80% of the nitrogen in these coastal forests is from salmon. So the salmon is actually living in the trees, and we actually can look at those tree rings and shave them down and look at their N15 signatures and figure out what the salmon populations were for each year. And so in that way, we can look at the fluctuation of the salmon populations over time. And we know now you know, that the sockeye population, for example, has plummeted to about 10% of what they were pre-contact. So we can actually trace that history much for a much longer period of time um, than we actually have fish records for. And interestingly enough, the, when, when the West Coast was colonized, what happened to those fish traps, which were so important in increasing the abundance of the salmon, which was linked to the grizzly bears and the wolves, and then into the trees, and it increased the productivity of the trees, which then fed back to the streams, which of course then fed back to the people. What happened to those fish traps is that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans went in and dismantled them so that the fish could be managed by the government. And boy, did we do a good job with that. <laughs> so one of the things that we're trying to do, my postdocs and my PhD students and I, are try to reconstruct these salmon runs and to reconstruct some of these fish pens, these fish traps, so that we can see whether or not these sa local salmon populations can recover. I wanted to make a note here too that one of the other ways that the Aboriginal people give back to the land, not only by putting back the biggest fish, the females with the biggest eggs and the most productive fish, they also, when they eat the fish, throw the bones back into the rivers. And that way they increase the micronutrient content of the rivers, which keeps the salmon populations healthy and the tree populations as well. Okay, so this is a story of responsibility, a responsibility to the land. <laughs> 
to take care of the land, to keep the land productive so that the land can reciprocate and look after us. Okay, so just to wrap up, <laughs> um, this is a very complex system. All these parts, the people, the bears, the fish, the soil, the mycorrhizas, the trees, are all linked together. They're all connected together in what scientists are now calling complex adaptive systems. Systems that are adaptive because they're biological and they can change. There's epigenetics can make changes that are passed on to generations. And these changes feed back to the individual parts of the ecosystem. And out of the interactions emerges these higher level properties like, like health and abundance and wealth. But in order to have that, we have to have the parts of the system. We can't selectively take parts out. What if we took the salmon out, which we're doing? What would happen to the bears? Okay, so it's a complex system. And out of this complex system, we actually get resilience, right? Resilience to withstand pressures like fire and floods. And yet, we look at our West Coast forests, and they're under increasing stress from climate change, and we're kind of pulling that resilience out from under their feet. But I think, I really do think that we know, uh, we know so much, right? We, there is so much knowledge in the land, of being in the land, that we know how to do this better. We can make these places more resilient. So in, in, in closing, I just want to say that um, my own journey has been a, a path towards resilience myself. I haven't talked too much about my own self, but I did follow through the scientific inquiry that I made to understand the resilience that I can see in the forest. And that this resilience comes from balance, which includes first being aware, learning about connection, that there's res having respect for the old things, the legacies in the ecosystem, knowing that there's reci reciprocity and relationships that this the system is built on those principles, that there's even kinship, even in plant communities, from elders and, and youngsters, and that we actually do have a responsibility to the land to keep the land healthy and strong so that we can be healthy and strong. And that comes from recognizing the complexity and of everything working to together, and out of this um, comes resilience. So with that, thank you so much for listening.